Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to Unizor Education. Um, I would like to uh, spend some more time um, and talk about the higher order ordinary, differ ordinary differential equations. Um, well, higher order actually means the second order. Don't want to go any further than that. That would be kind of pure theory, which actually I'm not interested in right now because I would like to demonstrate the higher order differential equations as they are applied to physics. Now, the previous lecture was about acceleration and I had a primitive um, uh, second order differential equation which looked like this. Some kind of function. Now, I will just do a little bit more difficult in this particular case. So that equation was just a uh, very simple one. You integrate twice and you will get function x of t. Um, now I would like to um, apply uh, a little bit different logic. And um, the application is a very physical problem, uh, which is related to the law which is called Hooke's law. That's about a spring. So, I will have a little bit bigger picture here. So, let's assume that you have a spring which is fixed on the left end and here you have some kind of a point mass M. Now, let's assume that this particular string is horizontally stretched and this mass is lying on a table um, frictionless table. So the mass can move left and right um, along this line, which we will assume this is an X line. Um, now this is a neutral position, so this will be X is equal to zero. And what our experiment is, we stretch this particular mass to another position. let's say D. So this is length D. We stretched it by D from its neutral position. So the question is what happens next if we will just let it go from this point. Well, first of all, we know the equation force is equal to mass times acceleration. Well, acceleration, we know what this is. This is second derivative of the time, uh, of, of the x coordinate by time. Now, mass is fixed. That's fine, too. But the force F is not a fixed force, and it's not dependent, basically, directly on time, because we don't really know how it depends on the time. We do know the experimental Hooke's law, Hook, Hooke's law, um, which says that the force actually by its value proportional to a distance we have stretched our spring. Well, obviously this is uh, an experimental law and it, it, its approximation obviously, uh, uh, obviously depends on the material the spring is made and it depends on how much we stretch it because sometimes we can really overstretch spring in such a way that it will not return back at all. It will deform completely. But within certain reasonable limits, our spring obeys the Hooke's law, and we can say that our force is actually proportional to uh, a displacement of its end from the neutral position. Now, the real law states that this proportionality has some coefficient k which um, is dependent on the material the spring is made of and it should be a sign minus here now why minus well because if d is positive force goes back right force is trying to push the mass back to original position so whenever my displacement is positive force is negative Whenever my displacement is negative, which means we are 
compressing the string, force should be move uh, uh, is directed towards positive direction, right? So it's always opposite to a displacement. So that's why there is a minus sign. And k is a positive um, coefficient, which depends on, on the spring, basically. How big it is, how strong it is, what kind of a material, steel, non-steel, whatever it is. And again, that's just purely experimental um, kind of a coefficient. But what's important is that for a given spring, and whenever I'm saying this is a given spring, it means I have certain value of k given to me. Force depends on the distance you stretch in this particular way. Now, if my distance is actually a function of time, then that would be my force as a function of time. So it's a function of time because it actually depends on the distance I'm stretching. Now, it doesn't really matter whether I stretch it to this particular, and in this particular case, my force is equal to minus k times d. Or I let it go, and at any moment, my mass is going back to the original, to a neutral position. Force is still uh, acting on this particular point mass, right? So, and the force is equal to exactly this minus k times whatever my position, whatever my displacement from the neutral position is. So, at, 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 at half the distance, my force will be half the force, minus k times, times d divided by 2. Uh, and at any uh, given time, wherever my mass is, my force would be exactly equal to this, where x is a coordinate of my mass, because my zero coordinate is a neutral position. So this actually represents a function uh, force as a function of time, and I can substitute it here, and what will I have? My Newton's second law would say minus k times x of t equals to mass times acceleration, which is x second derivative uh, as a function of t. So, from the Hooke's law and the second Newton's law, I've got this differential equation of the second order, because it's the second derivative. Now, what's good about this equation, I mean, what's easy about this equation? Well, it's linear, you see? All axes, all uh, derivative, second derivative, and the function itself are linearly related to each other. And that actually makes this particular type of uh, differential equation, well, soluble. We can really approach this in a relatively standardized um, fashion. So let me just rewrite it in the form x second derivative of t uh, plus uh, k divided by m x of t is equal to zero. So this is my equation. And I'm going to show you how we can very easily uh, solve it. All right, so let's forget about our pictures. We know everything about this. And let's consider just an equation itself. So the whole preamble of what I was just talking about before was to put some kind of a physical sense in, the, in this particular linear equation. Because I can start, okay, let's consider we have a linear equation of a second order. That's how we can solve it. That's not very interesting. This actually represents some practical situation. And, to be exact, the whole physics is about different differential equations, to, to, to be exact. Sometimes we are kind of masking this, if we are not teaching physics the way how it's supposed to be taught, I mean, using this mathematical background which we have. But physics is about mathematics and differential equations to the very, very deep uh, part of it. Okay, so, let's consider we have this particular equation, and I, I will uh, generalize it a little bit, and I will tell about, um, I'll talk about how to solve it. So, what's my generalized um, differential equation 
of this type, a linear differential equation. Well, I can always put it this way. Where P and Q are some kind of constants. In this particular case, my P is equal to zero because I don't have the first derivative and my Q is equal K over M. All right, fine. So whatever it is, I have this particular type of equation. Now, let me start with this one. Let's just for a very short moment assume that we have this. So k over m is equal to 1, just for one, one brief moment. Do you kind of have a hunch, a guess, what the solution might actually be? Well, recall that the derivative of sine is cosine. Derivative of a cosine is minus sine, right? So the function sine and its second derivative, which is minus sine, are together equal to zero, right? Sine of t goes to cosine of t goes to, what's the derivative of this? Uh, minus sine of t. So I'm differentiating. I'm differentiating d by dt d by dt. So differentiating one, I get cosine. Differentiating the second time, got minus sine. So this is x of t. This is a second derivative of x of t. And obviously, their sum is equal to 0. I guessed the solution to this um, not very difficult equation. Now, what if I have some kind of a coefficient here? Well, here is how we can do it. What if I will put sine of alpha times t, where alpha is some kind of a number? Then the derivative is cosine of uh, alpha uh, t times the derivative of inner function, which is alpha. Now, if I will differentiate this, uh, I will have minus sine of alpha t, and I will have here alpha square, right? Minus alpha square. So, if this is true, then alpha square sine of alpha t plus uh, second derivative second derivative of alpha t would be this, alpha minus alpha square sinus. So if I will add it with this, I will have basically here. So if my alpha square is equal to k over m, then this is an equation which has a solution sine of alpha t, right? So the solution to this one is sine of square root of k over m t. My first derivative will give me cosine times this square root. The second derivative would be minus sine times again square root. So I will have two square roots, which is k over m. And that's exactly what I have here. So I have guessed a solution. Um, now, are there any other solutions? Well, you know, I might actually think about something on the top as the solution which I can really think about guessing. Now, think about different signs between P and Q. Um, do you remember you see, what, what's the very interesting kind of a part uh, about trigonometric functions? Because after um, derivation, uh, they sometimes convert into themselves. Maybe the sign will be different, like we have to twice differentiate to convert sine into minus sine, and then we have to change the sign. So with proper coefficients, we really can manipulate these trigonometric functions. What other functions actually allow similar things? 
well, exponential function, you remember? If you have a derivative of e to the power of x, we get e to the power of x. So if even the first derivative actually converts into something. And then we can manipulate with different coefficients. So we have um, um, exponential functions and we have trigonometric functions. Now, um, recall the Euler's formula e to the power i t equals cosine t plus i sine t. Remember? When we were talking about complex numbers, we were talking about how to use complex number in an exponent, and that's where we were discussing this famous Euler's formula. Um, which basically combines trigonometry and exponential function, right? So it looks like trigonometry and uh, um, um, exponential functions are somehow related in the complex world, in the, in the world of complex numbers, and all of them have this specificity that the function is uh, transformed into itself after differentiation, maybe once, maybe twice, but in any case. So, my um, very intelligent guess looking at that thing is what if I will try to basically look for a solution to this particular equation in the form e to the power of um, lambda t where lambda is any complex number so lambda can be anything a plus b i, for instance. Now, differentiation of this function, which is not really a function of real argument, uh, which takes real values. We were only talking about differentiation and uh, integration, etc., of the functions um, which are real functions, real argument and real values. Now, this argument is real, but the value is complex, right? However, we can very easily expand all our theory, everything, whatever we did talk about in the, in the realm of uh, differentiation is actually absolutely true if lambda is a complex number. Uh, and that includes how to take the derivative. I'm not going to prove this, because the proof is really very easy, so let's just consider that it's true, and uh, whatever I was discussing as a proof that the derivative of this is equal to whatever it was in the real world, in the, func in, in the world of the real functions, exactly the same um, uh, line of arguments can be applied to this, because manipulation of the complex numbers is absolutely similar to mani manipulation of the real numbers. They have the same operations of addition, multiplication, division, etc., etc. So, what if I will differentiate this function a couple of times and substitute into this equation? What will I have? Well, my first derivative is lambda times e to the power of lambda t, right? My second derivative, I will have one more lambda, lambda squared. And, by the way, again, notice, since lambda is a complex number, it basically, this number, e to the power of lambda t, um, it, it generalizes the properties of both trigonometric functions and uh, exponential functions. Now, if I will substitute these into this equation, what will I have? Well, I will have lambda square e to the power uh, of lambda t plus p and lambda, the first derivative, and e to the power of lambda t plus q. Oh, I forgot. Sorry. It's not just q. I'm sorry. It's supposed to be x of t. Plus q to the power of e to the power of lambda t. I know that 
<laughs> into the power of lambda t should should cancel out, should factor out and cancel and disappear, right? So that's how I noticed that I forgot to put this x of t. So this is the type of linear um, equation of the second order uh, with constant coefficients and we are looking for a solution in this form where lambda is some complex number. Question is, will I be successful to find the solution? Well, quite frankly, yes. I have already been successful because right now I will just cancel out this and now I have just a quadratic equation for lambda. And any quadratic equation, as we know, has two roots in the area of complex numbers. Well, sometimes the roots can coincide, double root, but in any case it's still considered to be two. So we have two different lambdas which will uh, make this a solution. Okay, fine. So we found, let's say we found lambda 1 and lambda 2. Two solutions to this quadratic equation, which by the way is called a characteristic equation. So for this differential equation where p and q are constants and x is a function of real argument, this is characteristic equation which again within the realm of complex numbers always have solutions. So solutions are lambda 1 and lambda 2 which means e to the power of lambda 1t and e to the power of lambda 2t, my two different solutions, par 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 particular solutions. So I'm not saying this is a general solution. This is particular solutions, two of them. Now, since um, I I if these are two different solutions, it means uh, this solution makes this uh, identity equal to zero identically equal to zero, and this one makes it th this thing identically equal to zero, right? Well, it means that obviously any linear combination of them also will make this. So this represents a general solution. So, uh, can I assure you that there are no other solutions but this type where c1 and c2 are any complex by the way numbers no i cannot however i'm just asking you to take it for granted that this is the case so this describes basically all solutions to this particular equation okay that's very good actually because we have found uh, a, a very important expression for a general solution. Now, this is a general solution. Where do I get particular solution which corresponds to my physical experiment? Well, obviously C1 and C2 must be somehow defined. Right now they're undefined. And how can I make them defined? Well, I have to basically use the initial conditions. You know, what's the uh, value of the function, uh, let's say at t equal to zero, and what's the value of the first derivative? You remember for acceleration for the second Newton's law, we were using the initial position and the speed um, because our differential equation was about acceleration, which is the second derivative. So if I'm talking about the second derivative uh, as part of the equation, I have to have uh, initial conditions on the first derivative and the function itself. So it's always like one order below that should be defined somehow. And that what actually makes the complete solution. Now, now we know how to solve equations of this type. All right, so let's return back to what we have. Oh yes, one more thing. Well, this is a solution in the realm of complex numbers. Now, if we are talking about physics, we don't have complex numbers, uh, like distance, for instance, cannot be complex, right? So, out of this, I should really extract only the, uh, the part which is the, the real part and basically get rid of 
of, of the imaginary part of the complex numbers because otherwise because any function of this type can be you know represent can be represented as um, the uh, real part and the imaginary part and obviously imaginary part should not get involved so this is a very in it's a it's a very interesting moment actually because you see we have started with physics which is completely real world right then we have added trigonometry exponents complex numbers with all these uh, Euler's formula which relate them together added differential equation and now we have to get back to the real world to extract from whatever r r r solutions we have only the ones which we are kind of uh, are interested in which are real solutions so let's go back to our spring now our equation was Uh, x of t plus k over m x of t equals to zero where k is a spring constant and m is a mass well the traditionally um, we are using uh, omega as square root of k over m that's easier right so now what we do we do exactly what i have just prescribed using a generalized um, second order equation with constant coefficients so our equation is x uh, of t plus omega square x of t equals to zero right where omega is square root of k over m so let me wipe out this and let's solve exactly the way how I was just prescribing so first we are looking uh, at the solution in the form now if we will substitute we will have lambda square e to the power of lambda t plus omega square e to the power of lambda t equals to zero we cancel e to the power of lambda t and we get lambda square is equal to minus omega square which means lambda is equal to plus minus omega i all right which makes um, these are two solution one comma two which makes my general solution to this equation equal to c1 e to the power of omega t i plus c2 e to the power omega minus omega t i well obviously we don't like this to express our solution in the real world this i is definitely not needed here so we have to go back using the Euler's formula and represent it with uh, uh, cosine and, 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 and sine so it's c1 cosine omega t plus i sine omega t right plus c2 cosine minus omega t plus i sine minus omega t okay now what we can do well first of all we can get rid of these minus sign is here right cosine of minus something is the same as cosine of the something cosine is a is a even function now sine is odd function so this cos uh, sine of minus is minus sine and now we can get together the uh, all these parts now by, by the way where c1 and c2 are any complex numbers right you understand that so there are any complex numbers so what it actually gives us well if i will represent c1 as a complex number again 
and C2 as well. So this will be A1 plus B1I. And this would be A2 plus B2I. Okay? So what will be if I will do the multiplication? Well, I will have certain real parts and certain complex part, uh, imaginary part where I participate. So the, uh, the real part will contain cosine of omega t with some coefficient here. And it will contain a sine as well. Because you see, this is minus i and b i i. So if I will multiply them, i times i would be minus 1. So it will be again the real value. So I will have certain real values with the cosine and the sine. So basically I can say that I have this equal to some kind of constant with a cosine omega t plus another constant sine omega t plus everything else would be imaginary. I just don't want to, to do whatever it is. So I can say that at the cosine, what I will have with the cosine? Well, A1 would be a cosine, A2 would be cosine. All right? Now, what will be with the sine? Uh, B1 with a minus sign, and B2 with a plus sign. So it's B2 minus B1. That will, be, that will be equal to D2. So I can always find exactly what are these coefficients. But it doesn't really make much sense to find out exactly what these are, because C1 and C2, or A1 and, A1 and B1 and A2 and B2, can be any constant, right? We're talking in the very beginning that I can use any um, undefined, unknown constants and, and the solution will still be the same. So here is exactly the same. Since A and, uh, and Bs are uh, any constants, I can basically say that D1 and D2 are any real constants right now. And whatever is imaginary part, we are not interested in. So I can concentrate basically on this. The real part of my solution is represented as two unknown constants with cosine and sine, and the omega is given. Because spring is given, that's the k, the spring constant, and mass is given at the end of the spring as a point mass. So we have a solution, a general solution, real solution of our equation. So this is it. Now, let's just think about how can we find uh, a solution which corresponds our problem exactly? So let me just get rid of the imaginary part. This is my solution. By the way, it would be nice if we can check it out, right? So what would be in this particular case? Uh, the first derivative of this would be minus g1 omega sine omega t, right? That's the derivative of this. d1 is remaining. Cosine will go to a minus sine, and omega will go the same. Plus d2 uh, omega uh, cosine of omega t. So that would be my first derivative. This is x. This is x of t. OK. Now, the second derivative is derivative of this guy. So it doesn't really work well. I use this one. So, the second derivative of this would be uh, minus d1 um, omega square cosine omega t. Now this would be minus d2 uh, omega square sine of omega t. Now, if I will multiply my x of t, which is this one, by omega square and add to this one, I will get exactly zero, right? Because this is exactly omega square 
uh, greater than this, and this is also omega square. So my solution is correct. I just don't know what d1 and d2 are, right? Now, I can determine these d1 and d2 based on certain uh, initial condition. So what did I have as an initial condition? Remember, this is my spring, mass m. This is my table, frictionless. So this is my x is equal to zero, and I have stretched by d, and then let it go. What does it mean? It means that x of zero is equal to d, because that's the position, and I have stretched. That's my initial position of my mass according to this system of coordinate, and then I let it go, which means I did not really have any initial speed. So x of 0 first derivative is equal to 0. That's my two initial conditions. And they must be sufficient to determine my coefficients d1 and d2. Okay. So if I will substitute 0 into this, this would be sine of 0 is 0, cosine of 0 would be 1. So I will have d1, which means my d1 is equal to d. Okay, I've got that. Now, how about d2? Now we have a second uh, uh, condition. So first let's just have a um, derivative, which is minus d sine of omega t plus d2 omega uh, n times omega, sorry, d2 times omega times cosine of omega t. So, with t is equal to zero, my first derivative must be zero. Well, sine is equal to zero anyway, cosine is equal to one. So, um, if this is equal to zero, my d2 must be equal to zero, right? So, that's my function, d2 is equal to zero. So this is a solution which not only is a solution to my differential equation, but also satisfies my both initial conditions. So if we will stretch our spring by the distance d, and our spring has characteristics k and the mass attached is m, then this is um, the equation of the motion. Now, what does it mean actually? Let's just think about it. When t is equal to zero, my function is equal to d, right? So that's my initial position. from a uh, neutral position, we stretched it. Now, as time goes by, what happens with cosine? Well, um, uh, this particular function, you know, the cosine, it goes like this, right? This is zero. Now, this is, if, it, if omega would be equal to one, then that would be my pi over 2, right? But if omega is not 1, then that should be what? t should be equal to... omega should be here, right? Then if t is equal to uh, pi over 2 omega times omega would be pi over 2, cosine will be equal to 0. Okay, now what does it mean? zero. So it means that at t equals to pi over 2 uh, omega, my position, my x of t, would be equal to cosine of pi over 2, which is um, zero. So it means at this particular point, it will um, return back to a neutral position. What happens next? 
well then t is increasing and this is pi over 2 omega what happens in this particular case you see my cosine is negative which means that after going through this point uh, my spring will start compressing because my x would be x of t would be negative from the neutral position to the left so it will compress and at some point it will reach the minimum which is uh, cosine would be minus 1 so it would be minus d somewhere here so it will compress to minus d so from plus d it will go through the zero point to the minus d and then again back to the neutral point and it will oscillate back and forth back and forth infinitely because there is no friction and the spring is assumed to be an ideal spring so it doesn't have internal frictions the table is not it's frictionless etc so basically it will oscillate infinitely using this particular um, uh, law of motion well okay that that's basically all I wanted to to talk about today um, again don't forget what I said in the very beginning that the whole physics is actually filled with uh, differential equations my previous lecture where I was talking about acceleration and this one about Hooke's law these are just two examples um, in reality I mean if you will take a look at the electricity, magnetism, gravitation. I mean, differential equations are everywhere. And um, after I finish this uh, course of mathematics for, for teens, I'm planning to start physics for teens, and I will use all these um, mathematical apparatus to present the physical concepts. All right, um, that's it. Thank you very much, and good luck.